welcome to episode seven where my father and i call richie talk about fatherhood this episode means a lot to me this is the real reason why i do what i do on a day-to-day basis is being a man and being a father in my household so please listen in this is some great stories a little bit of background on my father and i and why we are who we are today and so i hope y'all enjoy and please listen Please visit our site at www.richstateofmind.com where we provide content on real estate, personal finances, and self-development. Share your story and information by posting a blog on our site so that the Rich State of Mind community continues to grow in knowledge. You can also follow our Instagram page at rich underscore state brand to find out about exclusive offers and discount promotions for our apparel. So, um... Hey, Dad, I appreciate you uh, being up here. So I know me and you, we could talk for hours, but I know one thing consistently that we've talked about, at least for the last seven years since Junior was been born, is, you know, parenthood and, you know, my experiences that I'm going through that I can now relate to you. And the film are things that you used to tell me that I probably didn't, you know, really acknowledge or realize until I ended up being a parent myself. <laughs> and so um, one thing that we, we've talked about is uh, – ensuring that we don't pass generational curses. Um, from your point of view, uh, what do you think about that? Okay, well, I'm going to start by just saying um, I am so proud of you as your dad uh, for you starting this podcast and, in a sense, continuing the legacy of education. You know, as me being a teacher, <clears throat> and here my son is taking what he's learned um, your knowledge, your wisdom, your insight and foresight and putting it into this podcast for people to hear, um, to hear things that they may not normally hear. So um, as a dad, I can't be more proud of you with that. I never um, thought about like that, the teaching part. That's yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Uh, a profession that no one thought that I, no one expected me to go into. And I never expected I would stay in it as long as I have. Um but that's probably a testament to the call on my life uh, to be an influence to young people. <clears throat> but um, in regards to uh, uh, not perpetuating, uh, continuing uh, generational curses or, or how I also like to describe them as generational patterns, <clears throat> um, that is... Um, that's a tricky one because, you know, you can look at it from a spiritual point of view um, that in a, in a Christian faith, generational curses or patterns are behaviors and mindsets that the enemy has strategically, very carefully planted in um, earlier uh, uh, parents and they unaware just continue these pattern behaviors. They fall into these uh, negative patterns of thinking and model it for their kids who grow up and see that. And as much as they want to try and do better than that, sometimes we fall into the behaviors of our parents uh, because that's what was modeled to us and and it just goes on. So there's that spiritual perspective. I mean, then if you can be, you can be secular about it and take the spirit out just simply from a psychological point of view, um, it's easy for a parent to tell their child, do as I say, not as I do. But if you see your parent smoking or drinking or um, having uh, behaviors that are not productive and conducive to a healthy lifestyle, um, then you, you know, a child is going to model you know pick up those behaviors that have been modeled for them uh you know unless maybe a mentor or someone who has just as much or maybe even greater influence in their life their lives model something different for them and for whatever reason they gravitate and have a great deal of respect for that person and they compare the lifestyle at home and the, and the lifestyle of this person that they highly respect 
and then they choose the one that they say, you know what, I think this this role model in my life is is a better choice. You know, so whether you look at it, slice it up, psychological influences or spiritual influences, these generational patterns are for real. Um, and they can go on and on and on, you know, until um, someone becomes aware of them. And that's the tricky part, because that means you got to self-reflect. Yeah. Um, you got to be able to look at your life and the life of your parents before you and and come to that very hard conclusion that, you know what? My daddy did this. I'm doing this. How is it helping me right now? And if it's not producing a... Um, the kind of lifestyle, the kind of thinking, the kind of behaviors that would create children who can be stable, emotionally stable, balanced, healthy, um, you know, solid self-esteem, a good sense of who they are, um, you know, a good citizen, all those wonderful qualities. If it doesn't produce that, then you have to make that hard decision that, okay, I've got to change. And that is, and I, yeah, I I, I agree because I think so. One thing I appreciate is when you know, throughout the years as we've talked, you took a self a hard look at yourself when I was born and said, okay, these are the things I want to instill in my son, and these are the things I don't want to. And you know, you weren't perfect, and I, I I'm me being a father now, I'm not perfect, but you were able to show transparency that hey look these are the things I wanted to make sure that you didn't have to worry about or I didn't want you to deal with these these emotional baggage you know baggages yeah. and uh, you know I want you to even down to the fact that you named me opposite of you right you know Anthony Carl Richie and your Carl Anthony Richie uh, I think that in itself was something to, to ensure like hey I don't want the next generation to have some of the vices I had and so when I think about now I'm an adult, now I'm a father, I think about, okay, what are some of the vices I don't want Anthony to have to deal with? And one thing I want him to have is uh, confidence. I think that's something that you spoke about early early on. You had an issue with was confidence. I know for me that it took me a while. It took me a while, and I think it was baseball that really helped me throughout that process. But I want him to be able to find his vessel to – you know, handle the, I guess you want to say the concept of, of confidence early with, to be comfortable within himself. And that's something that I wasn't for a long while. And I noticed from talking to you, the same for you. And I want him to be comfortable in who you are, comfortable and, and you're uh, and confident in what you're capable of doing. Not, you know, not to the point where, you know, you're arrogant, but very, very comfortable. You know, your capabilities, you know, your strengths and your weaknesses. So you know how to maneuver. Uh, so you don't over project yourself yeah. or do you, you don't under, you know, you'll underestimate yourself. Oh yeah. I like that. I um, like that. I like, I, I gotta tell, I gotta tell that baseball story because <clears throat> the baseball was so critical in shaping the man you are today. Um, again, it's even something that even all these years later, I still get emotional about. And in a nutshell, I remember um, you were getting really annoyed that every season you had to try out for the all-star team. Um, you had, you would, you would be maybe your batting position was, was way down the line. And I remember you would say, dad, I've already proven myself. I mean, you were like 11, 12, 13 years old. You're like, dad, I already proved myself. Why do I got to keep doing this? And, um, and it would it would hurt me because yeah you clearly had demonstrated that you were uh, a highly athletic highly skilled baseball player, but every season it's almost as if they never remembered what you did last season. You always were put like at the low rung on the ladder, and <clears throat> but what what you demonstrated though was in your frustration, it's. I don't maybe without you even realizing it, you chose to take that frustration and put it in the bat 
Because when they when you were in, let's say you were batting eighth, and I'm thinking of Cooperstown. When we went to Cooperstown, obviously you had to be skilled to go up there, and they put you in that last batter position. You might have been eighth, ninth, or tenth. But then when you the first the first game I didn't play at all. Although you didn't play the first game at all. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, I didn't play the first game at all. I was crying. And I was like, what the heck? Like, y'all brought me up here. You know, grandma, grandpa, you, y'all spent all this money to come up there. Y'all ain't made me, y'all don't play me the first game at all. Yeah. And then the, the next game is when they had me, like, batting yeah. last. And I remember going to the coach and asking the coach, I said, listen, you know, and that was after the first game, You they didn't play you. And I said to the coach, you know, like, well, you know, is my son going to get to play? Like, how come, you know, I thought everyone was going to get to play. I don't remember the coach said to me, this is not an equal opportunity organization. Now, I could have took that two ways. I could have took that two ways. I just looked at him. I think my mouth was open a little bit. And I decided to let that one go because I, because I didn't want to say anything that was going to uh, maybe retaliate against you and they bench you. But that was just typical of what you experienced. And then when you got up to bat and you cracked that triple, and then you got up to bat again, and I think you cracked a double and maybe uh, um, um, scored like a RBI. Then they moved you up to, I don't know if it was fourth batter. I think it was second. I think it was second, second batter, batter the next game. Man. And yeah. then, then you're cracking home runs. But, but see, but that was the story of your of your uh, youth baseball career. <clears throat> and I mean, I would be on the sidelines, listen to parents say, "Yo, whose son is that?" You know. And it was, but every year you would demonstrate your ability to to um, come through as a clutch player, and 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 that's when you began to recognize your value, and that's when I started to see in you something. Like I, I started to really get insight into your abilities as a leader. And then that's when I felt God say to me that one day when we were at the end of the baseball game, I think you were 13, and I said, the mantle of leadership is upon your shoulders, man. You're going to be a leader of, of men. And I have been saying that ever since. But it was that baseball and the, and the, and the trials and the disappointments and the disillusionment um, you know, I could have been the kind of father that said, man, later for those people or or later for those white people, um, because that's oftentimes what we had to deal with, you know, and we kind of felt that sometimes it was because you were one of maybe the only one or one of two black kids on the team and they were maybe giving the preferential and the better positions uh, to the white players. Um, it's funny you mention that because I did take pride in when we used to play other AAU teams there would be that other black kid on the team and he would be one of the nicest people on that team. Oh, wow. Like, it was one black kid. He was good at hitting backside. And he actually left the Green Bar Panthers to play for another AAU team. And I can see why, because, like, dude was like, I'm going to take my talent somewhere else. And he was he was nice. Oh, wow. And I, I took I took pride in that. Like, I was like, that's what's up. Like, even though, you know, he's, he's killing my own team, <laughs> I was just like, that's what's up, you know. I like to see, you know – him being recognized, you know, I think he was bad like fourth or third, and, and they used to shift the whole outfield just for him, and shift the whole outfield, and I knew, so for me, that's when you know you was the stuff, when teams recognize your power, and they have to shift their positions for yeah. you, and I didn't get, I didn't get like that type of respect until like maybe high school or something like that, or later in like uh, AAU time where people used to shift to the lab and stuff like that. And that's when you know, like, all right, we're going to show this guy some respect, you know, because this dude got some power. Yeah. And uh, that was that was kind of like small moments to me. I don't know if I ever explained that to you, but I used to like that because they, they do that in the MLB. You know, they used to, for Barry Bonds, they used, everybody used to switch to the right, <laughs> right and deep. That's you know? it. That's it. I think um, I think getting back to the fatherhood piece of it all, as a father – um, the way I, the, I could, like I said, I could have handled it in a way that was not beneficial for you. So, you know, my dad struggled with self-esteem and he became a doctor, but some of the racism that he experienced, uh, in medical school, <clears throat> um, you know, it really broke him down, but he was determined to get his medical degree. And, and, you know, now that he's gone, when I looked at his, um, medical, the picture 
uh, that he took with the family. I was 10 at the time um, when he graduated from medical school and my mother and his mother and his, and his mother um, had a party for him. Uh, I was too young to really appreciate it. But when I knew, learned the stories that he went through of the racism and that he had coming from the hood and he accomplished becoming a medical doctor, but still struggled with self-esteem, um, you know, and that was, you know, I was like, man, that's such a shame. That was such a tragedy, you know, because I, I felt like if my dad had overcame that, maybe at, at a much younger age or, or had a mentor to help him through that, the, he, the things he could have accomplished even beyond. Or his father. His father, or his father being active. Or his father being even more involved in his life. Um, and then I struggled with self-esteem, you know? So recognizing that I struggled with self-esteem um, and, and, rec- and struggled with understanding my worth uh, was one of the reasons why I said, when your mother said, let's name him after you, and I said no, because the kind of man I was at that time, I did not like, I didn't appreciate. I, I, I knew that there were things about me that were jacked up. And I said, no, my son will be the opposite of me. And so that's why, you know, Anthony called Richie instead of call Anthony. And that was, it's funny because that is a prayer that God heard because in your, while I was a hot mess in my 20s, um, you have come out of the gate you know, like a, like a, like a, a high valued speed, man. And you have arranged and organized your life in such a way where I was chaotic, still trying to find myself. Um, you've spent your twenties building upon a foundation that has been laid in you uh, and a foundation of, of confidence, uh, of, a foundation of knowing that you're going to face trials, but you can't overcome them. You know, I think, you know, with with Cooperstown, when your mother and I, I remember when we went to the cafe, we knew they were posting stats. And we rented, I don't know what it cost, $15 for 10 minutes. We found some kind of cafe. We just wanted to get online just to see the stats they were posting of all the players. But on that particular day, you had hit, I think, I know you hit at least one mm-hmm. home run. Uh, batted in RBIs. Um, you might have hit two home runs. When we got there and we pulled up the website, they listed the other players' stats. They didn't list yours. We were crushed. Now, in a mo- in that moment, as a father, I could have went back, cussed out those coaches. Would have I could have been so angry, and I could have modeled for you. A, a lack of control um, in how to handle that situation. But what we opted to do was we weren't going to tell you. In fact, I didn't tell you for years later because I did not want to crush your confidence. You were there. You were enjoying yourself. You were having success. And I was not going to let whatever their motivations were for not posting your stats, um, I was not going to let that crush you. And so I... I saw that happen to me too in high school. That actually happened. So that actually happened to me again. I didn't know because I because I never knew you uh, that happened to me until you told me. I think you didn't tell me until I was actually graduated from high school. You told me that story, yeah. but I that happened to me in high school when we went against this t- team in the playoffs, and I pretty much had the best stats. And then it's like a picture of somebody else. I'm like, what the heck? Like nobody, the dude pitched like a two hitter, and like. Two of those hits were like me. Wow. Hey, you still don't have me up here. You don't have my oh no, no, it was a northeastern game. And I was the one that hit a home run. I had like hit a home run, a triple, and some other stuff like that. And then they put the stats of somebody else. I'm like, but everybody knows you put the you put the stats of somebody that hit the home run and the RBI. I think I remember that. I think I remember that game. I was because you went to go get the ball. That's exactly right. It was, it was a it was a back it was a backside home run. Yes, that. it was. So I was just like you, I was like, right. yes, it was. I remember that. I remember as soon as you hit it, that thing was coming over. Um, I think I vaguely remember that particular piece that you just said about them not posting your stat. But you see, then again, here it is, another situation where you were not given the respect that you would do. You were not given the, the recognition that you would do. 
And I guess some would argue the world is not obligated to give you that. So, you, <laughs> no, but not. as a parent, you try to lay a foundation for your, your child so that when they face those type of moments, they don't go off and blow off with the handle because anger, you know, I mean, anger has its place, but in the end, if, it, if your anger doesn't translate into something that's going to change the situation or be productive, uh, it's, it's almost not worth it, you know? And um, I know you were disappointed, but then look what it produced in you. Again, another situation where I was not recognized and given the, the recognition I was due, but that didn't stop you. And you've had to climb. Would, yeah. You've just continued to climb after that. I would say throughout, um, definitely throughout the years, and uh, I can definitely appreciate it um, in my adulthood is the fact that you always, because I, I don't know, I think I told you this one time, and I, I'm so mad that I waited so long to tell you, but that like, I, 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 you are the only male that I re- figure that I really, really look up to. Like I have a few mentors that I've met in the Navy, but you are the only one that I really, I say like I look up to. And uh, one thing that I always appreciated about the fact about you is the fact that um, you're tra- you were transparent with me. Like, hey, I could do X, Y, and Z, but I'm still human. And one thing with Anthony is, you know, with me raising him, I, I already could tell he doesn't want to disappoint daddy. But I don't want him thinking I'm super Superman uh-huh. <laughs> and that he can't ever live up to the expectations that I set for him, which they will be hard. They will be tough because I see the generation. I see I see people that are about 10 years younger than me, how they are already. And I'm just like, OK, wow, like this is the future. And so some of the pe- kids that are his age, I already could tell, too, like, Anthony's going to be – it's going to be really hard for Anthony to relate to some of the people in his age group, being that how – the I would say the trajectory of how the mindset of parents. Yeah. And so you were pretty clear that, like, hey, I, I may not want to – I'm not going to do you like my, my daddy did me, but I'm still going to be tough on you. And I'm also at the same time also going to let you know that, hey, dad, don't, dad makes mistakes. Uh, because I think that – you know, you don't have to tell me in depth, like, you know, well, dad spent, this is not saying you did this, but dad spent 50 bucks on lottery and on liquor. And that's why you can't have a biscuit. Today. But you would, <laughs> uh, you would tell me particular things in, in a way for me to understand that I, I was like, okay, a man, this is what a man does, but he's not this invincible being. And for the world to expect him to be that way is unreasonable. And I think maybe sometimes when it comes to being a black man, you you have like one strike, you, two strike. You already got two strikes yeah. on you, so you, you have to be flawless because after that it's you're, you're down the toilet, um, and so that I think you relieved a little bit of that pressure for me a bit, and I think going through baseball also did that too, so that I could kind of see the, kind of the tug of war between the two, and so Anthony so far I don't think he had, I, obviously he hasn't identified really like okay black white people and. The, you know, the, this is how the world systematically is against me. But I did explain to him, I said, look, man, I don't want to tell you these things for you to be pessimistic and grow up to where you got the whole world on your shoulders when you get out of my house, yeah. and, you know, go on your own. Uh, but I tell you these things from daddy's point of view, and I'm transparent with you on how he feels, because I want you to grow up not thinking that things are just so black and white. You know, yeah. so clear cut. There, there, there are there are so many va- factors and variables in this world that we can't, uh, you know, consider. And one of those things he was telling me, I think I had mentioned in one of my other episodes. He talked about. He said, uh, "Well, as long as I try, you know, that's all that matters, <laughs> right?" And it's I. It made me think instantly of like everybody gets a trophy mentality. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I told him, like, you know, you think daddy goes to his boss and he says, well, as long as I tried, you know, and I talk, I don't perform. <laughs> but you like, I was like, Anthony, that's not how it works, man. Like I said, sometimes it's OK. We'll, we'll say, hey, you know, that's, you know, as long as you try, that's all that matters. But at the end of the day, Anthony, you have to provide results. You think I'm just going to let you keep telling me as long as I try and you keep m- making your bed the wrong way? Yeah. No, he knows that. He knows that. <laughs> 
And but I, that right there is a clear indication of like what a lot of people, parents, children think. Like they parents be telling their children about that, and it's I think it's the wrong mentality to have because you lead your child to believe like because you see the transition into adults. I see adults that are 19, 19 20 years old, and it's like, yo, what, what what's, what's your deal, man? Why are you on me? <laughs> you know, they're not used to being held accountable. Uh-huh. They're not used. To, they just they used to getting the good jobs and a pat on the backs for doing simple stuff. Oh, I didn't. Oh, you know, I, I peed and I didn't. I, I didn't miss the toilet bowl. You know, and it's like, but you're like 17, yeah. bro. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that <laughs> anyway. I think um, uh, competition is is healthy. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think it's detrimental to uh, children to teach them uh, that you don't lose. There's always a winner and loser in life. You know, like I've, like I've shared with you before, there's always someone who has more than you and there'll always be someone who has less than you. That is just a, that is just a fact about the world in which we live. So, you know, this idea of, everyone's a winner is a lie. And it doesn't, I think, foster within a, uh, a young person a drive and an ambition to be better than someone else. And, you know, but you also have to temper that with humility. Like, look, you're good at this, but don't make someone else feel horrible because they're not as good. Um, so, you know, as a parent, it is very hard to, to try and really be nuanced in your parenting where you're trying to build up the confidence, build up a work ethic, build up a character in your child, but then also temper that with, you gotta be humble and you've gotta take the talents that, that you have and these abilities and you use it to serve your um, your fellow man, your classmate, your, your friend or, or a stranger, you know, when so led. Um, and, and, and that requires a level of parenting that um, is nuanced, it's complicated, uh, it's skill, uh, it's trial and error. And, and I think when I began to realize the, the major responsibilities and complexity of parenting, it's one of the reasons why at 25 years old, that Saturday morning, as I've told you the story, I had to call my father when, and I remember your mother was sleeping, uh, you and Ashley were sleeping. I looked in both the rooms. I said, oh my God, I'm taking care of these people. And all the responsibility of just at the at that time in my life, but also what I saw coming down the pike of taking care of you guys. Uh, I remember I called him up, might have been 7.25 in the morning. I said, Dad, I know this is 25 years too late, but I got to thank you. And, and let me tell you the significance of that, because my relationship with my dad still was very, very tense, very tense, very strained. We, we hadn't come to a place where we could, um, I guess, like each other. So, but for but I was so moved by what I was doing. And even though we battled for most of my adolescence, I had to recognize that the model of taking care of a family came from him. So despite whatever flaws I saw, I had to give him that respect and recognition. And I called him. Uh, I don't really remember his response. I, I, I don't know if it was like uh, kind of a told you so response or he was just kind of <laughs> chill about it. But, you know, I just remember how I felt. I had to, you know, recognize and call my dad and just tell him thank you, you know. Um, so, but I think what you were talking about with, um, with you know, with Junior and just teaching him um, – you know, you being transparent with him, that is also a very scary thing. And, and, you know, you know, grandma never agreed with that. She felt that I was way too transparent with you guys. Um, and, you know, <laughs> and I could see why she would say that because I remember I was on the phone with her one day and Ashley came up to me and was asking, can she get something? And I said, well, I don't have any money. <laughs> Ashley said, well, you just got paid. And my mother was on the phone. And she said, why, she, why does that girl know when you get paid? Because I remember sitting down with you guys and showing you, like, look, you asking me for money. Look, at this is what I get paid. And these are all the bills that I got to pay out. I'm thinking I'm doing something. Um, 
And I'm thinking in being transparent and letting you know the, the burden, the responsibilities of maintaining a household. Yeah, well, let me show you what we bring in and what goes out. Uh, but there's a trade-off with that. So while on one side you'll see, oh, okay, well, when dad says, yeah, there's a lot that it takes to maintain a house, you get that. But at the same time, if you want something, you know when I get paid. So I can't say, well, I ain't got no money because you're like, well, dad, you just got paid. And I remember my mom was really hot about that. But there's still no way we can understand the concept of money the way we do now as adults. No, no. But I, I do think there's something to be said about planting a seed. Because there are some things that you and Ash and Lee will say to me that I said to you um, <laughs> in your youth. And I'm thinking, you guys forgot all about it, but you kick it back to me. And it just continues to prove that when a parent speaks, and if a parent is strategic in what they're saying, um, and maybe and even repetitive in what they're saying, something sticks. I mean, we learned as teachers that it takes about 30 times to say the same information over and over. It takes about 30 times before it moves from short-term memory into long-term memory. And then if you attach an emotional experience to that, it, it definitely is getting in that long-term memory. So, um, you know, so to say it, and even though the child may not fully get it, it's a seed planted. It's a memory that's been placed. And it's something that I feel that God can use to kind of bring that memory to the forefront and in your private moment, when you're, you know, sitting on the toilet or you're eating a hamburger, that memory will come up right when you need to remember it. I, in my own life, I've experienced that, you know. So I think the transparency piece, uh, again, uh, you know, as parents, you got to recognize there's a trade off. You you're letting them into your world. So there's certain things they may know about you where some parents are not comfortable with it. You know, my parents grew up from that generation, you don't tell your child none of your business. In fact, they will go into their bedroom and close the door and all family decisions, any anything major that my mom and dad decided was behind the closed door of their bedroom. <laughs> and that was it. There was none of that. Hey, let me sit down and share with you my income tax return and just tell you, hey, listen, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we did. These are the mistakes we made. Oh, there was none of that. And, and I'm not going to fault them for that because that was how they, they were raised. They were raised by the silent generation. You know, they were, you know, the silent generation, you know, they, uh, they, they put their head down, put their hands to the plow and they didn't look back, you know, and, and there's some goods with that and there's some bad with that. You know, that might've been a generation. You don't go to the doctor, you don't talk about your problems and you definitely don't go to therapy. Yeah. And, you and, know, and they don't go to therapy. That's definitely not culture. <laughs> You know, that, yeah, that's a definitely not. Yeah, that's definitely the two things. That, ooh, like only you know the black black community I've seen like they get on you about therapy or and mental health is something serious that I've realized about in my adult life that now, you know, it's not weakness to there's no weakness in trying to seek help um, to handle that because I've seen in a lot of black families where things a lot of things are put uh, thrown underneath the rug. And not dealt with. And you'll have a whole alcoholic, uh, child molesting, you know, a, a physically abusing person in that family. And everybody would just throw it underneath the rug and, and not deal with the trauma that or the PTSD that was dealt with, dealt upon the, you know, the, either the other adults or the children in that family. And yeah. um, I think it also that's also a family or a family, you know, archetype, if you want to call it, that doesn't really it doesn't really uh, encourage expressing yourself like, Hey, how, this is how I feel about this. Like, this has really got me really jacked up. It would kind of, it's kind of like, don't talk about it. Nope. Nope. No. Or even that, like it didn't happen. And I think that's another thing too. I appreciate growing up is I felt like I could talk to y'all uh, as mo as much as a, a kid would be honest to y'all, you know, obviously kids <laughs> lie to y'all, you know, their parents, but yeah. I, I think I, I think I lied less because of the fact that I, I knew that you, you and mom were receptive. Um, I see that in Anthony a little bit, you know, I, I look at him sometimes, I try to look at his cues and I'm like, Hey, what's on your mind? And the person will say, no, like, nothing's wrong. And then he'll say like, you know, he'll start talking. To him. And that's what I don't want. I don't want to be so fearful of getting in trouble that he does not tell me. Cause I tell him own up to what you did, you know, understand that 
what you may do has good or bad consequences. And but don't be afraid of those. Um, speak yeah. speak your mind. You can speak your mind respectfully. Um, but I want you to always. I don't want you harboring anything because you got uh, our kids are exposed to so many things now because of social media that uh, you don't know what's going through their mind. It's not as controlled as it was with us growing up or with you growing yeah. up. You could really control it all. I think the only thing you had is influence was radio, TV, and family. You know that's it. Um, and for you, it was radio, TV, family, um, and MySpace. Yeah, you know, and Facebook. You know, and that wasn't um, even until I was at least like fifteen. I was already kind of fifteen years old at that time. So it's not like for them. That's like they're five and six and seven and. You know, because they're playing online with other players now. Like, remember Sam was playing against that five-year-old on Destiny? Like, they interact with grown adults. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We got – we've had them really monitor the kids playing with – on the Xbox, the boys, because they're friends – they're making friends with former students of mine, which I guess is is okay, but (laughs) – but now they're older now. I mean, they, some of them are, are probably out of high school at this point, but they recognize my my PS4 and my Xbox um, name, you know, and then they say that they're kids. I don't know them. So, you know, who knows what kind of conversations they've had. And I know some of them have used profanity, so we've had a, you know, we've had a monitor that. But you touched on about him not, uh, well, first of all, um, I like the way you describe that, that being, allowing you to be more expressive with how you're feeling was like, like relieving pressure. I never quite thought of it that way, but that's, I I think that was definitely um, maybe an unarticulated motivation within me was that because I could not for a long time be able to talk to my dad that way and and tell him how I was feeling, I had to stuff it down. I couldn't tell him that, hey, dad, you know, some of the words that you would say to me when you would discipline me, they hurt me. Um, Because, you know, when, you know, with that generation, it's like, no, you don't speak. Shut your mouth. You don't speak. Be quiet when I'm speaking. Uh, So, so taking that experience, I said, no, I want to be a better communicator. I want my, my son and my my daughters to be able to express how they feel because that became very, very important to me. And again, and again, no shade to my dad because, you know, you know, as a parent, you do the best that you can. And the best that you can is based on what you know, however little or however much. Uh, So in retrospect, you know, I see some of the things that he tried to do um, and I and I recognize the vision that he had to to he wanted to have a family, he wanted to be a family man. Uh, just unfortunately, you know, certain things just you know got in the way of that. Um, but that was a lesson that I learned from him, but but indirectly because he did not allow me to communicate. I wanted that for you. Now again, there's the trade-off. The trade-off was there were times that you would say things that would shock your mother and I. We didn't expect that coming from you, not so much in a disrespect, but just some of the information you would share about your personal life and we were not prepared. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I won't, and I won't say anything now, but it was just kind of like, oh, wow. But then as I think about it now, well, thank God that you were able to <laughs> express it. Um, but, but also there were times when we would get into it, you know, uh, particularly in those teenage years, when you were like a, a sophomore, junior, high school man, when you would really start to uh, vocalize and when what you felt was different than what the value uh, or the, the rules that we had set up, uh, yeah, then then you were, were vocal and then there were times where it was like, okay, yeah, you can express yourself, but now there's a limit, you know? So, there's so it's a- around that age when I kind of started to express Hey, I have different views on this particular topic. Yeah, and that was that was a little tough. I, I, you know, as a as a parent, you know, that was tough to deal with because you up until this time, you know, you thought what I thought, and you, you know, because this is what we were teaching. This is this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when you started coming, um, especially when you started working, 
um, you really started to express the different different opinions about how things should be done in your life, this and that. Yeah, that that was tough. That was tough. And there was one one ugly confrontation we had when you were doing dishes. And um, you really went the opposite direction, or at least you were saying this is what you were going to do. And, you know, that's when, as a parent now, I had to step in and say, okay, okay, no, no, no. That's my son. I love him. But in this particular moment, no, I'm dad. And this is the way it's going to be. Um, and, that, you know, and that's what you have to do. I think sometimes, and I've witnessed this as a teacher, I think sometimes parents can be afraid, you know, to be the parent, which is being the uh the authority over your child and they are worried about how the, if their child's going to like them or not. But the one thing I got from my dad when I was arrested for the second time where he yoked me up in that living room, put, picked me up off my feet up against that wall. And he says, you may not like me and we may not be friends, but I got a job to do. And I remember my first thought. And when he said that, I'm thinking, I'm not going to not like you. Well, that, that, that was prophetic because for those next six, seven years, boy, we did not like each other. Uh, but, you know, he stayed on me and I never forgot that. And, and that was him modeling for me that as a father, it's OK to be sensitive. It's OK to be empathetic towards your child. But there comes a point where it can't be about if you're going to like me or not, um, because when you become a parent, you're going to recognize what it takes to be a father, to be a parent. Uh, and until that time, I can live with you not liking me because I got a job to do. And that is to aim you in the direction like an arrow. You know, the Bible says that children are the quiver uh, or arrows in the quiver of a, of a father and mother. And so with that metaphor, I've always felt that it is the job of a parent, but especially a father to aim his son in the direction he should go. Now, you may not like the direction, but you know, <laughs> it's okay because there are things that God has told me many, many years ago, son. And even recently, I read something I wrote 27 years ago. And I'm reading it and I'm like, oh my gosh, you said this to me, God, back then? This is what you meant? And I'm like, God, why would you wait? all these decades for me to finally understand something you try to tell me all that. Year. Why didn't you kind of drill that down into me? And I realized, I said, God, you're a beast. You're so, you are so confident in who you are as God that you can wait until I finally get it. Despite me getting it wrong about you all this time. And that, and so I guess I got to also mention that as a father, a lot of my cues about the kind of father I wanted to be was not just from what my dad did right and what my dad did wrong, but also what God showed me, the kind of father he was to me. And, um, and I felt that the kind of father that God was to me was he was telling me that he loved me and, and, and didn't hide that and didn't make any bones about it. He made it clear repeatedly through things that, through answered prayer, through him speaking to me that he loved me. And I remember, um, this might be a bit off the topic, but I do remember one time uh, I came, I was walking up the stairs with the belt because it was something you did. And it was like kind of that final straw that broke the camel's back and you needed to get your butt beat. And as I was going up the stairs, I could feel God saying to me, as I have been gracious towards you, and by the time I got up to the stairs, I said, son, I don't know if you remember. I said, son, I'm going to handle this situation the way God has handled some of my mess ups with grace. I'm not going to spank. Just learn from this. And I, 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 my memory of it is that you were very, very surprised. And you just knew that, I, that you were going to get a spank. Um, <laughs> but, but I took my cue because I... Because that's how God dealt with me, though, because there were some things that I messed up on. I know I messed up on. But he did not always give me what I deserve in terms of a consequence. So there were some things, some of, some of the dumb stuff that I did just as an adult that God saved me from. And I saw that, oh, man, it could have went another way. But, boy, thank God it didn't go that far. And I just felt that that's the kind of grace and the, the kind of relationship 
I wanted to to have with you that there's mercy, you know. Um, and I know some men have an issue with that. They don't want to show weakness. But I don't think kindness and graciousness is a weakness. Um, yes, it does maybe, maybe set you up where a child, if you do it often enough, a child might take advantage of it. But the result is a man, a child, a son that would grow up and, and, and be strong, but also have the wisdom to know when to be gracious, forgiving, and merciful. Because not every single time when you discipline your child, you got you to gotta beat them down. You know, you don't have to spank them. Um, sometimes when you discipline your child, you can simply just reason with them. There's, and I guess that's the, that's the other challenge about fatherhood is, again, that, that complexity, knowing how to judge the situation, how to react, how to handle what your child said to you or did and find the right way to reach them and teach them the lesson. You may want to spank them, but you can't always operate as a parent based on emotion. You know, you, you know. <laughs> I just know this made me laugh. I think about the times of Anthony, just this look, re- look of relief on Anthony's face when he sees that I'm not about to spank him or uh, really get on him. He just looks so <laughs> relieved. <laughs> You made me think about just sitting on the bed, just like, oh. <laughs> you know, he's like breathing. <laughs> you know, and he'll remember those moments. Do you, I mean, But let me ask you, do you remember that particular time that I was speaking of? Actually, I do. Uh, I do remember that. Um, and I, I remember thanking God in my head, like, thank you, God. Like, <laughs> because I knew it was coming. Like, it's that's the worst feeling, yeah. waiting on a spanking. <laughs> like, <laughs> the worst anticipation but that but that example that that experience you'll carry that on into your fatherhood because and i think this ties in with something else you said you wanted to talk about you know um and we've touched on it already just the expressing of emotion um this idea which i think is a false idea that there is one type of man and you know and i'm not talking about you know um, this is separate from, you know, anything that's related to LGBTQ this is separate from that. But, you know, within the, within the, the, the um, I guess the framework of, of your, of a standard man, you know, um, this, this idea that, you know, the, the father is, is hard and, and strong and unrelenting. And, and those are qualities that, serve a man well however it makes him one dimensional and me and auntie were talking about it my sister and I were talking about it because some of the things that I have endured in life I said well you know one reason why I was able to get through it is because I noticed about me that I'm very long suffering and very gracious and her response was she says you know but why should you be you know you're a decent guy you know you deserve you know, um, to, you know, better. You don't have to deal with that. And I said, you know, years ago, I would have agreed with you, but I would have had it wrong because I was made to feel, and this comes into the self-esteem because I, I didn't know my value. I was made to feel years ago that that was a weakness. And I remember praying to God, like, Lord, make me different. And then through a series of events over years, I finally learned that that was the kind of man that God made me to be. Now it's always good to adopt some character traits that you admire and that you think would serve you well as a leader, you know, as as a father, as a provider, you know, so there's nothing wrong with, you know, seeing something that you see in someone else and saying, you know what, I want that. So Lord, could you help me cultivate that within me? But, you know, God gives us these base core personalities and, and I was thinking that it was a weakness, but my long suffering, this quality about me to be gracious in the face of someone who deserves, who maybe other people would say, no, nah, they don't deserve that. That is my strength. That is what people look to and they lean on and they get comfort from. Uh, they're strengthened by it. And I didn't recognize that value in me. 
you know, but, um, but, and so my point is, is that there is a variety of fathers, not just the authoritarian um, do as I say, and you better do it in two seconds, um, show no emotion, maybe say, I love you on a holiday and that's it. No, there's a, there's a wide range of different kind of men. So there's a wide range of fathers. And, and I just encourage men to find, you know, be comfortable with the type of person you are. If you're not a hyper aggressive guy, that doesn't make you less of a man. If you're a highly sensitive, empathetic yeah. man, that doesn't make you less. Maybe you might have to use more wisdom in terms of how you express it to certain people because there are some people who are just predatorial and they will leap on that and try and take advantage. And, and maybe even some kids do that. So sometimes there has to be that those moments where you got to pull back and, and be authoritative. Um, but I just encourage men to be, you know, recognize who you really are, the core of who you are, who God made you to be, and then recognize the value of it. Um, and then just build upon that. Um, and not made not be made to feel anything less because you don't fit a certain mold of, you know, the, you know, the ultimate man, you know. Yeah. It seems like actually, I guess as time has passed, it seems like being that type of man is almost played out now. Almost. Uh, I've seen it to be it's more acceptable for a man to be more emotional, more in his feelings. But the 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 con is now he's more uh, how do I put this? The roles have reversed in some ways. You see a lot of men getting uh, proposed to by women. Yeah. <laughs> or they're 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 fine with you know the woman t uh, taking the lead on all decisions in the household, financially, you know, spiritually, everything. Um, and some of those, so some of the roles have changed. Not to say that, you know, a woman can't uh, do just as good, but I, I my, from, you know, from learning from you, grandpa, you know, and how I intend to teach, you know, Anthony, that you, you know, the man, he's the one that gets on his hands and knees and gets dirty and makes stuff happen. You know what I'm saying? You do that so that your spouse and your children do not have exactly. to endure that. You are the umbrella. You are the umbrella exactly. for your family. Yeah. And um, I would say that's the only thing where I feel like, hey, at the end of the day, Anthony, you know, you need to be making sure you do this. But I totally agree with the, the archetype. There are many archetypes of being a man and being a father that I feel like there was for a long time you know, it was, they kind of looked at you crazy unless you were that own, that yeah. particular archetype. It's just that now it's just things are kind of getting mixed up now. And, you know, you know, what is it? Yep. Do as thy wilt, you know, <laughs> mentality. Yeah. You know, so it kind of gets mixed. It kind of gets the, mixed uh, up. That phrase you just said, uh, do as thou wilt. Um, the origin of that is um, the guy who started the Church of Satan. And because it's an antithesis to do the will of God, you know, we're all created for a purpose, uh, a purpose that long before the world was established, before the foundations of the world was laid out, God had thought of each and every one of us and fashioned us with a particular purpose to solve a particular problem in the world today. And so, you know, our lives should revolve around, okay, God, what is it that you want me to do? Because in there, you'll find fulfillment as a father or as a mother, you know, or as a leader in your industry, your career, whatever. And the do as thou wilt, you know, kind of moves, do as you feel, uh, which means that there are no, there's no absolute truth. There's no, um, there are no procedures that you should follow, best practices, you know, to become a good citizen, a, you know, a, a a morally stable person. So, I mean, I've got some some issues with that do as that will. Uh, but, you know, on the other side, um, I have to say again that just being the kind of father that I was, uh, imperfect, uh, but whatever I did right, I've got to give God that glory for it because, um, you know, there were those times where I made wrong turns with you in terms of how I may have disciplined. 
Uh, and I can think of one particular time I went to bed and God's hand was on me all night. I couldn't rest. And I had to make that thing right with you, you know, and that, and, and apologizing to a child, to your child. Uh, I have known some people, they would never do that. Um, and I felt that that was, um, that was one of my strengths uh, was to be transparent when I felt like, you know what, I disciplined you yesterday out of anger, not for the sake of teaching you a lesson. Um, and I think that is a parent's greatest strength because it models for the child, one, you will make mistakes, which is part of adulthood, part of life. Two, um, if that child was feeling that they were wronged, you've acknowledged that and you recognize that. So it makes it makes them feel like their opinion and their feelings matter, you know, and through it just ultimately models humility, which is um, which is a quality sorely lacking by a lot of a lot of um, a lot of leaders, you know, in our society and in our culture. You know, this is true. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I could think about that a lot of times. It's it's okay. It's a, I guess parents think of it as a weakness to say, you know, sorry, or that they messed up. And I guess it goes back to that transparency. I, I think I said, I remember one time I said sorry to Anthony because I told him I was going to do something I didn't do it. And he was just like, it's okay, daddy. You know, I understand. Oh, wow. And wow. Uh, he, he it, it's, it's, I say this one thing is very relieving to know that your child receives your intentions and your love and your discipline mm. all at once. And, oh, that's what I meant to really, really pit on, too. So you talked about this is this is almost like one of the biggest foundations of my parenting with Anthony is when you disciplined us, I knew there was still love. Like, I knew you didn't <laughs> hate me, you know? <laughs> and because uh, I think some parents don't like their children. I think so, like too. Them. And so one thing that I – that stuck with me. So one thing with Anthony – he, I get on him hard, but he knows I love him. And I always try to make sure after, you know, spanking or some type of disciplinary action, you know, I think the worst I ever did to him was he, I made him do like a, a, a squat, <laughs> hold a squat. And I, he started crying and he, and he was like, you know, I said, hey, Ed, you got two, because he did something so jacked up and and he knew he was wrong. So. I was like, Anthony, if you break that squat, you're getting your spanking. So you get the pick. So he held that squat for as long as he could. And he's like, I can't do it anymore. And he just, yeah. and he just took the oh, spanking. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> he was in that much pain for the squat. And uh, after that, you know, I talked to him. And he understood that I just wanted – he's like, I understand that you just want the best for me. And you want me to uh, give it 100%. And that was a really good moment um, that even after that, I was able to talk to him. He didn't want to, you know, hold some grudge against me or, you know, not talk to me for an hour wow. or something like that. He he understood that it was just he, he had to be held accountable for what he did. I think it was like the third time I told him to stop doing something. And uh, and I gave him I told him, like, hey, it, something's going to come up, man. If you do this again, I'm a, dad's going to be real creative. <laughs> behind you, know, this point. you see, that's major. That is, see, that is so major that even at six or seven years old, I'm not sure what age he was when he articulated that. He was, he was six. He was, he, yeah. At before six I years old, he articulated that I know you want the best for me. And so this goes back to, to the very first thing that we talked about in terms of generational curses and patterns. So in our family, um, I know with my dad, um, you know, his father... Um, was not a major presence in my dad's life. So my father said, when I get married, I'm going to be there for my kids. Now, even though my dad and I were adversarial through, during my adolescence, and I did not know that he loved me, although my mom would tell me that a, some, a lot of his discipline was he saw things in me that, he, that reminded him of him and he didn't want them repeated. He just didn't have the finesse on how to do it in a way without breaking my spirit. So what that did, so he did a bit better than his dad, 
I said, I'm going to communicate better than, you know, my dad. So then I did that with you. And so as you can see, there's the progress generational patterns being eliminated. So there's not going to be this an, uh, an absentee father. Um, we've moved from a father who was here and there during his, his life um, and having some influence to now we have a child that can be physically disciplined and turn around and say, I know you want the best for me. That's major. That, that's major. And that's how you change patterns. You've got to change how you think and how you approach things. Um, and I can only imagine, I can only imagine where this family and speaking specifically about the men, what future fathers are going to be like, what are they going to do? It's going to be amazing to see Anthony Jr. grow up and what kind of father he's going to be with all the, I, uh, the uh, new things that you are bringing uh, to your fathering of them. Yeah, I'm very, I am very interested in that. I, I look for, I'm kind of looking forward to see how he's going to be as a teenager. Um, there's going to be probably that point in time where he's going to buck up like I did to you. And um, probably, probably he's a, he, I, might, he might have a different temperament, but it, but all as a teenager, he, he'll try. <laughs> yeah uh, it should be it should be interesting um, i'm looking forward to it dad um and i appreciate you taking the time talking to me um and doing this interview because Always. um it's definitely a lot and i'm getting kind of emotional thinking about it you know this is we do this for our legacy and i i, see, I feel like this is the reason why we are existing because to make sure because when we die can't keep the money can't keep all the material things one thing that we do can pass on is the mentality um, and some uh, good characteristics that we hope to our next generation for the Richie family to continue to grow um, in different positive ways. And um, I feel like each generation we have, we have grown, we have made progress. And I hope when, you know, when anybody listens to this, they think about their family. Yeah. And each, each generation, you know, has it grown? Are you progressing? And what can you do for the children that you have now or intend to have to ensure, you know, don't expect to be perfect. Um, but definitely, uh, I remember Pastor Kim Brown saying, you know, uh, stop, stop dealing with the same old sin, like have a new sin, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so I would say for families, you know, just get all, get get off of that. Get those old generational curses or back head through his, off your shoulder. And if, if anything, let it be something new that you have to attack and not the old ones that have been hurting for generations. Dad, so what would you consider your rich state of mind? My rich state of mind would be recognizing that what I do now echoes far into the future. And when I look at you now, the kind of the man that you've grown into, um, at the time, I wasn't sure if I was doing everything right. But, you know, the Bible says in all labor, there's profit. And so my rich state of mind is that every effort that I made um, to to raise you to be the best person you can be, it, it it wasn't a waste of time. You know, even in my mistakes, you learned from my mistakes. You know, so uh, there is no every effort that is made to improve, to be better, uh, to grow. It is not a waste of time. You may not see the fruit of it until much later in life, because some trees. When you plant them in the ground, they sprout within two weeks. Others, certain trees, the seed takes years to grow before it breaks the ground. And so I think um, just as a parent, as fathers, we got to remember, make every effort to pour into our kids, pour that foundation, plant those seeds, and, and just trust that our efforts are not in vain because I'm looking and listening and witnessing you 
uh, become the man that I wish I was at your age. But but I can have a great satisfaction in just seeing you be the man that I've always wanted you to be. Mm. And then now let's uh yeah let's let's end it with a prayer, Dad. I appreciate that. Okay, Father, thank you so much for just this moment. Um, while I I so appreciate what you've done in my son's life, um, my prayer is that anyone who listens, um, fathers, soon to be fathers, uh, men who hope to be fathers, um, even sons, Father, I pray that whatever nugget of wisdom or insight, knowledge that they can gain from it, it would go down deep into their hearts, take root, and ultimately bear fruit in their thinking and in their actions. It is never too late, Father, to be a better dad. And every effort that we make towards the end of raising up good children, productive children, wise children, Father, no effort is wasted. No effort is in vain. So um, I just ask, Lord, that you um, give everyone who's who desires to stop any generational patterns or curses, to have better relationships with their children, with their parents. Show them how to do it. Release wisdom. Release understanding. Even send people into their lives who can show them how it's done, how to do it better how to model it for them. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.